Stick it up. Okay, does this work? Sounds like it works. My name is Stu Soffer. I live in Menlo Park, California. I work on, Palo, on University Avenue in Palo Alto. I've been in Silicon Valley 40 years now, and I am amazed. And what's amazing to me, it's uncanny, that all the speakers who were here earlier, certain th themes emerged, and I'm going to weave them into another talk now, hammering home options that occur. I started out as a programmer. I was a VP of software development. And at some point along the ways, I morphed into another career of analyzing intellectual property problems involving software. Oh, this is how that works. How does this? Which button? Okay. I've got a little map here of Silicon Valley. It's a big area, actually. The uh, blue circles are an indication of the market capitalization of the of the internet of the. Uh, public companies, and one thing that happens is Silicon Valley is not a new thing. It's 70 years old. And if you look at this chart, over time, it has reinvented itself in numerous, with different paradigms of technology. Early on, in terms of vacuum tubes, all the way now through to social media, and the latest thing coming out in Silicon Valley are unattended vehicles and driverless cars. It morphs. And how does it sustain itself? And when we look at this, do we figure out that what happens to the people who are working in these companies? Do they change as well? And you know, obviously not, because people who did vacuum tubes don't know anything about software at this point. I arrived in Silicon Valley right over here in 1977. At that time, Silicon Valley was a hardware-centric environment. You had people making disk drives. You had people making chips. You had people making CRT monitors. A lot less in terms of software development of applications. The internet really wasn't proliferating at that time. That became obsolete. If you look at 1977 when I was there, The power of computing was in large corporations and, or, uh, and organizations. Computing was expensive. You had to go to IBM, buy a mainframe, buy a staff of programmers, buy the equipment. And standalone people like ourselves did not have computing, tower, computing power for ourselves to create new products. After 77, about that time, something the first phase shift occurs. Apple comes out with the Apple II, IBM comes out with a PC, and all of a sudden, everyone was equalized to the corporations in making new products. That was an explosive thing. Quick indication of what happens financially over the years. You've heard about internet boom. The internet boom one and the internet boom bust. That was around 1999 and 2000, 2001. I was living in Menlo Park at the time, and life was just amazing. Companies were being funded for what I would call just features on an application. And that people were hysteric about it. They'd go public, and everyone was making money. What could go wrong? But what went wrong was there was no there there. 
One thing that occurred about this time is that someone came up with a, an online gossip column called Fucked Company. And what would happen is inside employees from a lot of the companies started spilling the beans to this uh, gossip site and they'd be published on the web. What happened one night, my wife and I were at a restaurant in Menlo Park and we're waiting for a table and behind us is a, is a couple. And I'm listening to their conversation through one ear and I realize that this is the couple that was being spoken about on Fuck Company that day. So this is crazy. There's a book out on it, the guy who did it, and it's really worth good, good, it's really good reading to see what was happening in the minds of people at that time. Fortunately, it crashed, and I say it's fortunately because it was such an unhealthy situation for everyone to be in. People were getting funded, they were throwing money into renting office space at a capacity that they couldn't sustain. So a lot of investors' money was just going to rent office space. Not a very good idea. But setting all that context, we come up to the issue is, how do you bulletproof yourself so that you're more marketable as you age out, as Dan said? You know, a lot of times, it's really true in Silicon Valley, you get 30, you get 40, you are less sellable and you have less skills. Even though you may be the best programmer in Silicon Valley, it gets tougher. So we're going to I came up with this theory of uh, careerpreneurship and how you just keep on reinventing yourself and morphing to do more highly valuable tasks, value, value tasks. That's me in that little pho photograph when I was in college on a PDP-8. Paper tape input, assembler language programming. So this is my, my history in 40 years. I have an undergraduate degree in computer science for the University of Wisconsin. I was a programmer. I moved out to Palo Alto, was programming an assembler and ran up the chain of computer-related tasks. Project manager, VP of software development, and was getting involved in some very good application areas. Real-time process control, uh, library automation, clinical information systems. I was doing a lot of really good systems. By accident, unintentionally, I had a call one day from a lawyer Asking, uh, was I Stu Software? I said, yeah. Did you write a paper on touchstone phones? I said, yeah, I wrote that paper when I was an undergraduate. It's not silly stuff. So what, what you did is what we call prior art in patents. And we represent IBM in a patent case. We're defending them. And what your paper did is prior art. We want to talk to you. Come to New York. Went, and I'll tell you that story. But I became an IP expert, worked a heavy in, in expert witnessing, and along the way I put together a database of intellectual property information. That took on its own life. I licensed it to Stanford. I used that database for doing empirical studies of trends in, in litigation of intellectual property. Sometime along the way I had a fellowship at Stanford Law School studying internet and society. And then uh, another outgrowth was a, a legal textbook, which I co-wrote with, with an attorney. The demonstration here is that I morphed over those years, all based on work that built upon prior work. And as time moved on, I found more interesting and more valuable things to work on. So the question I pose, and which Dan posed and other people pose, is will you be re relevant in 10 years? And what are you going to do to prevent that, to keep that true? And essentially, is you're responsible for that. There's no one else who's responsible for your job security. So how do you do this? So early rec you know, you've got to re recognize opportunities early on. I told you one which I did where I saw, instantly saw the need when I went to New York to talk to the law firm for IBM. 
instantly saw the need for someone who could speak technology and law to bridge technology issues with legal issues. And I said, aha, no one else is doing that. I asked the attorney, could I make a career out of doing this? They said, no. I took the case, it went to trial, it was the most amazing experiences I've had of seeing a real trial of a patent against software. What you've got to do in career, career entrepreneurship is reinvigorate your enthusiasm. Hard to do, but you've got to find new things in your job and new things outside of your job to entertain yourself. One thing I found that really helped, and it's counterintuitive, is by volunteering. I started volunteering in Menlo Park in government affairs on the planning commission which set zoning issues, and they gave, that gave me certain skills which, you go, which are hard to get. Every two weeks there's a public meeting, about five people come forward, you're evaluating whether they should get a new fence or not, whether they should build a house on top of a school. And in the process of that, every week or every two weeks, people in the community see you. They see you debate and consider information and what sort of decisions you make from that. Turns out, sometime later, someone who saw me man running, uh, chairing a meeting, said, would you like to join the patent review committee of our company? Major international company. So then for six years, I'd go to their patent review meetings and I'd see their new inventions and what they were considering inventing. Applications they were con considering filing. And you listen to the inventors talk about things and you give a thumbs up and thumbs down and vote. Just a byproduct of, of volunteering. And the volunteering gets you new skills, which you're not going to get otherwise. Someone mentioned risk. I fly helicopters. That's my risk. And everyone says helicopters are not safe uh, things to fly. Well, I think they're safe. You practice emergency procedures all the time. You practice closing the throttle as if you had an engine failure and gliding down in something called an auto rotation. You do that a bunch of times, you get a lot of confidence with risk. And someone brought up risk when he was jumping down on the bungee. That has such an incredible effect on you of doing something that's a challenge, managing it, conquering fears, and you feel really refreshed if you can achieve something like that. An office neighbor of mine climbs Himalaya mountains in Tibet. That's how he refreshes himself. Talk about investing yourself. Conferences, I go to a lot of conferences. I used to go to Microsoft developer conferences every year. Uh, get the first develop for 15 years. I had a subscription to MSDN and had the latest release of every operating system and product they had. I was on top of everything that was coming out of Microsoft. Someone mentioned management. This is really, really, really important because when you come out of tech schools, you are not a manager, necessarily. You may have those skills. I've seen people who are natural managers, and that's great, but we're not natural managers. One thing you can do, what we have in the States, is a company called, a group called the American Management Association. And they have five-day seminars for tech managers, for newly appointed managers as much as skill sets that you need to start a company. From organizing people to a common goal, I really recommend learning how to manage. And I'm not talking about an MBA, I'm talking about a nuts and bolts management course that's gonna help you at the day you leave that, that, that course. Get passionate about something. Uh, it helps your thought process, it gives you confidence. Uh, it's an amazing thing that when you're talking to someone or you're trying to sell on your skills, that you're able to talk about something that shows passion. 
I get called in to do due diligence of companies before people invest. And there are a couple of questions I might ask the founders. And I'll tell you the questions I ask founders. One question I ask is, who's got the passwords? You have to think about that, because you may not know who has the passwords. You know, we're writing you a million dollar check. We want to know who has the passwords. No. So they don't run out. What I ask people is, what are your hobbies? And they're shocked that, that I, that's what I'm asking. Because I, I know they're programmers. I know they know what they're doing. I want to know what, what turns them on. And I'm looking for a passion. I'm looking for something that's going to put a gleam in their eye. And what you've got to do is see what is it in your life that you're really passionate about. And someone would ask you, what are your hobbies? You can, you can tell something which really fires up the interviewer. Project for you to work on. It's easy to do. Social contacts. I'm not talking about LinkedIn. I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm talking about face-to-face. -face. Get confident in meeting someone who you don't know and paying a compliment. I like your tie. Good shoes. That breaks down barriers. Real easy to, to get, pay a compliment. Little secret. Another thing to sustain your careers. I call it master the obscure. Master what people, master the difficult things in technology. For example, uh, technical standards. Before people implement them, find out what the standards are and find out what the market is. Who's going to be using a, a standard in upcoming products? You'll be the go-to go person for, for, that, for that work. I've done it in library automation. I've done it in internet protocols for search and retrieval. I've attended standards review committee meetings. Get involved with standards groups. They know where the jobs are. That's high value, high value, it's high value work. Serendipity, and we all face uh, forks in the road. In my life, I've had forks. Going from being a VP of software development to uh, an expert witness and working intellectual property was a fork in the road. People said I shouldn't do it. <coughs> Excuse me. I was going to go, consider going to a, a conference of lawyers, of IP lawyers, to meet them while I was considering still doing programming. And I asked a lawyer, what, is it, what would I, if I went to this conference, would I be a fish out of water? They said, yeah, that's not for you. Don't go. I said, what the hell? I'm going to go. That's where the lawyers are. That's where my customer base is. So I went. And it was amazing. I got so much work out of it. I went where no one else was fishing, a fishing pond where no one else was fishing. Fork in the road. Long ago, before I really got started in that, I would send letters to attorneys who had cases that I was interested in. Not an email, a letter that signed with a signature introducing myself, saying what I do, what my background is, and what I'm looking to do for them. Out of 100 letters, maybe I get three calls back. That's work. That's great. One guy writes back, calls me up, says, I've got your letter. There's something you can help me with. Great. So it was an early case on uh, deep linking on websites, on copyright infringement uh, on the web. I go in, I work on this case. And I got, became friends with this attorney who, it turns out, was a really high-powered litigator and was always going to the World Economic Forum by invitation. He brings me in for another case. I do that. Time goes on. He calls me up. says, Stu, would you... I'm considering making an investment in a company down here. Could you come down and have a look at it? Tell me what you think. I fly down to Phoenix. We go over, see this company, go back into the car, and I said, uh, I really don't feel comfortable telling you what you should do with your money, advising your investments. That's not my department. He says, don't worry about it. 
calls me back and says, Stu, I'm buying that company. I want you to run it. I said, I can't. I really don't want to do it. That was a fork in the road. It was a missed opportunity. I blew it. It was, it was bought by a, a big uh, internet music streaming company. I blew it. I didn't know. I wasn't comfortable with, with it at the time. So when you see a fork in the road, you got to th think very carefully about risk and war reward. I mentioned before people telling you, don't do something. And it happened several times. You know, when I said, do you, well, can you be an expert witness uh, by a profession? Or can you, should I go to the, law, to the law, law, law conference? People will talk you down from doing something, which really is in your interest. And it might be they think it is a great idea. They don't want you to do it. Do it. Don't be shy. And what I'm really talking about uh, here, when I sent out letters of introduction to people I didn't know, introducing myself, who I am, what I did, my background, what I would consider doing for them, don't be shy. Because there are people looking for you. There are people with fires on their desk that you could help out, do, help out putting out. Maximize your interactions. <coughs> Excuse me. In Silicon Valley, that's fairly easy to do. I don't know about here in Warsaw, but I, I sense it is possible. You've got Google Campus here. Google Campus is going to be a great place for you to go to attend meetings there and, and meet other people. Maximize the people you see. When I've gone to conferences in Munich, New York, Tel Aviv, every time, and, and here now, every time I meet one or two people who I really resonate with, and we stay in contact. We become friends. And one guy I met four years ago, we were really studying startup environments, what made a good, strong uh, ecosystem, sustainable eco ecosystems of technology, of innovation. We started a company. He started it. I did his initial patents. I invested in it. They're in the virtual reality, augmented reality space. It's, it's great stuff. Professional, social, go over to Google campus, community, volunteer with the neighbor in the, the city you live. Meet more people, meet more of your neighbors, because they know other people as well. Those are more, ne that's more networking. You can burn out. I burned out uh, a couple of times. Recognize when you need a break. You can't do it full, full pitch, full force for years and years and years and years. Uh, take a, you know, uh, academics take leave, leave of absence, sabbaticals. You need sabbaticals once in a while. I was working on a project in Hong Kong years ago. I was there for nine months. Burned out, came back to Palo Alto. I said, I'd like to take a leave of absence for the summer to work for the University of Wisconsin for the Cancer Center and just program for the six weeks. A break. I want you in a break. I want to do something else. I wasn't going to a competitor. They said, no, we need you for another project. I said, I quit. I come back to the office the next day. My manager says, if you feel that bad, that strong that you want to take a leave of absence, take the leave of absence and come back. I said, nah, feels good. I quit. So I did my summer in Wisconsin came back to Palo Alto, and they became my first client as, as a consult, consulting. But recognize when you've had enough and you need a change. You need to just refresh your head and get back on track. You'll be more efficient. You'll be able to run a lot longer with a break. Summary, you've got to find mentors. When you start in college, start uh, graduate school, start your friends, find people at Google campus. Find people who you can talk to over the years. 
I have mentors who I've known for 40 years or more, and a couple of times a year, something happens, I need feedback. I need a second opinion on something that I'm facing. I'll call up my friends, my mentor friends, say, what do you think? Five minutes, it's resolved. Mentors are very important because they look out for your health. Maybe you want a buddy system, two people just call each other and check. Do it. Cross-pollination, one thing that happens, and we do with Silicon Valley, and Stanford is very good at this. I look at the Stanford Law School, it's not merely a law school, but they really believe that since they operate in the context of Silicon Valley, they really want the engineers and the technocrats to understand law. And they also want the law students to understand technology. Cross-pollinate. If you have teams, bring in people who know the application area you're working on, make sure that they can understand everything, the context. If you're working on a hospital system with this critical care, go work in the hospital for a week and see how everything works. Manage risk. Do something risky and master it, and it gives you such confidence. You know, not that you can go something, do something stupid, but you, you, you wash out your, your, your fears, and you get such, such confidence afterwards. Volunteering, I mentioned. Management education, go do it. Here in France is a group called INSEED, I-N-S-E-A-D, which may have the management courses. Five days, or maybe they have it online. Learn how to be a manager of people. Embracing the obscure, embrace the stuff that's hard to do, the stuff that people are not doing. I did this with standards in library automation and standards in, in search and retrieval on the internet. I packaged things into toolkits, into DLLs, and I licensed my stuff, licensed my code to the industry, to all the vendors in the industry. It was obscure stuff. If they didn't do it, they had nowhere else to go other than sending people for years to develop the standards. Come up with your story. I mean, not a lying story, but tell, be able to tell why you're different and what gives you passion, what you're passionate about. Don't be shy. S introduce yourself to people professionally, socially, and this is important. In return, be generous as well to others. They may, someone else in the room may need help, and give them five minutes. That's it. That's me. If anyone has questions, I'll answer maybe one question at this point. I'll be here today and tomorrow, and feel free to pick my brain. Who has a question for my friend Stuart? Please, there's uh, he's with a microphone. Give me one question, otherwise I'll have to invent myself one, and I'm, I'm enough on stage already. Come on. Hey, guys, are you that? Is it, it's not lunchtime yet. You're not supposed to be that tired already, for crying out loud. Give me one question. The first one, if I know it's no always question, a question. Ask, always me, ask me, who do I know in Palo Alto? So I come again? And who do I know in Palo Alto? Tell me a Palo Alto story. Who do you know in Palo Alto, then? Ah, glad you asked that. Uh, the Titus wanted me to bring up the people who you just run, and run into on University Avenue. And uh, I take it for granted. Zuck, at the, have you seen the movie uh, Social Network? At the time of Social Network, his office and Facebook's offices were on University Avenue across the street from me. He rented a conference room above my office as a private conference room so we can have meetings without anyone else seeing. Piece of trivia. Uh, you go down University Avenue, there's more Hebrew spoken on University Avenue in Palo Alto than in Tel Aviv. Odd fact. Uh, uh, Jim Clark, founder of, of Netscape and Silicon Graphics. I knew him socially in Palo Alto. I went to his second wedding. I went to his second divorce. His... <laughs> his uh, Ex-wife at that point rented an apartment from my apartment while I was working in Belgium. Uh, who else do you see around? Uh, ah, come on, sir. Jobs! Uh, of course. 
Oh, your microphone actually just turned off, guys. Okay, how do I? Oh, yeah, there you go. Go. Jobs. Uh, early on, he had a girlfriend on Forest Avenue where I was living in Palo Alto, so you'd see him walk, walking down the block with his girlfriend. No big deal. Uh, at the time of the Steve Jobs movie, which came out last year, I'm watching it. I'm watching the story very intently because this is the one where they're doing three product releases. I'm looking at uh, his assistant, Joanna. So, I know that woman in reality. And the, 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 the woman who played his assistant, who was always keeping him on track, was the girl in, in Palo Alto, I've known for years and years. And then you, you see the gossip columns. One thing I, I told you about, fuck company. That's about it. <laughs> question? So is, there, is there a question or should I wrap it up, guys? Yes? Uh, come. Oh, I see over there the very... Sir, almost lady, ma'am, come up. Ma'am, thank you, by the way. I come up appreciate and that. We like door number one, please, door number please two. Please state your name so can people can personalize you. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I just have a question about the risk, because you said it's very important to prove that you can take a risk. <laughs> so I'm very curious how to show that you are uh, ready to take a risk, <laughs> how to measure that. <laughs> Let's keep it simple. Are you afraid of spiders? So, I mean, it's, maybe it's like a... I see it. I love flying, but in order for me to fly and get certified so I can take a helicopter and fly around the Bay Area, I've got to demonstrate things that look tough to do. That's the cost of doing something that's enjoyable. You master the risk so you can survive it. People do other things. I, did, I, I bring up auto rotations and helicopters. Uh, I showed the helicopter picture to a lady I met at a conference in Munich, showing her fly pictures of me flying around. And she says, that's nothing. Look at this. And she brings out her iPad. And it's a picture of her wing walking on a biplane on top. I said, I am humbled. I am humbled. You are, you are, you are tougher than me. This is really cool. Then she brings out pictures of her hanging from a balloon doing aerial silks. The silks are touched the, to the bottom basket of a balloon. And she, the balloon is up in the air. She's doing ballet with the straps hanging underneath the basket. Now, she mastered that. She's good at it. I don't think there's anyone else in this room who could do it. I certainly wouldn't do it. But those are the sort of things that when you see their passion in their eyes, and they've challenged, they've conquered the risk, they're, they're uh, Unbeatable. Sure, that's the end. Thank you. You think anything else? Yeah, there's another question. Uh, I think I don't know if you see if it's a gentleman over there. Yes. Thank you, sir. Please state your name. Yeah, hi. My name is Sherry. I'm from Berlin. I just came for the uh, conference, so thank you for your speech. Uh, I guess my question is on you. You mentioned mentors. So, yeah. Uh, I guess, what's the process and how do we find a mentor? What are some values we can get? You know, what do we ask them? I guess a little bit more insight into that. Thanks. There's not one answer to that. I'll tell you what mine is. The first mentor I had was when I was an undergraduate. I took a, an independent study in computer science one semester. And I worked with the professor. We got a paper out of it. He became a mentor. We had a personal, I really recommend this. If you're going to school, you find a professor or someone who's teaching, you establish a relationship. It's a combination of professional, a combination of career, and they can become a mentor for you. It may be a teacher, you, you know, teachers you've had. It may be uh, someone you meet. Go, go to Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. But I think that's really important for your health and decision making. There's a lot of things you feel uncomfortable with about talking to how to resolve it. You can't talk, you can't talk to your spouse about it because they're not under the protective order or you know, they don't, they're not going to understand it. They're, they're in a different career. 
They're not going to be able to help you and understand the implication of what your decision is or the problem you're facing. I think it's important. You, important to find it. Uh, always be on the lookout for someone. And you may know at first. There's no one says, here, I'm a mentor. It's become through repeated contact. And it, it grows slowly. And uh, it, it helps, your, helps, your, helps your mental health and your decision making as you go through. You say, we're having a terrible time at work. I don't know, should I quit or not? Well, you can't talk to your boss about that. You've got to find someone you can talk to about that. You could pay a shrink 250 bucks an hour and spill, spill your guts about it. Nah, that's too expensive. You want a friend, someone you have a relationship with. And work on it as early as you can in your career. How do how, mentors? I know I certainly have maybe two. I have a group of people who do what I do in, in intellectual property. They're about, it's a group, maybe 60 in Silicon Valley. Bunch of us gray heads, gray, we all have gray hair. We've all been engineers, we've all seen a lot of work. We're very good mentors for each other because we've been the, seen the same problems. We, here's, here's something we do, we do. We have an email list. We have a very close private email server where we can ask questions of each other in confidence. I don't know whether you can develop that sort of thing here. But we all trust each other. We all do very high level, high value work. We all tell the truth in everything we do. And it's a safe place where we can ask questions of, I'm having a problem with this client, what do you think I should do? That's uh, one way of doing it. Sorry. It's a great question, but get a men get, find mentors. It could be your sister or brother. It could be your uncle. Someone in your family. Do you want to take another question? Sure. So last one. If somebody has, I'll allow one more because I'm very nice today. Usually I'm very on the clock. Who has the last question for here? Uh, guys, microphone, just the lady over there. Should I? Oh, my goodness sakes. Give me a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to do it. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask about your tips on being generous, because you said it's important, and I think it's also mm, very important in social media, uh, like giving feedback, like supporting others. But it's really hard to keep on being generous when you're not uh, rewarded. I know. <laughs> and that's what's, what, what you, you tips... You have to have faith that hey, you're doing a good thing by being generous. And at some point, it'll come back to you in some way. Not, may, maybe not from that person, but you're, you're getting good points for doing, helping someone out. Giving a recommendation. I mean, you only recommend people who you really know and do a, do a, a recommendation, who you can legitimately recommend. But giving a recommendation is a good thing. You know, I know Cheryl, she's a great person. I've worked with her for five years. She's a good person to have. I'd hire her if I had a, a position for her. Go, no, go. I'd, uh, Sorry. <laughs> any, another question, or is, there was something I was going to say? About, what was it? I forgot. I will be here today and tomorrow. You can pick my brain, take advantage of it. I can't mentor everyone, <laughs> but uh, I, work with, I do work with startups. I do advise them on IP strategies. I'm going to ask one question. Yeah. Uh, how do I get to fly with you on a helicopter since you fly helicopters? How what? How do I? Am I able to join you in a helicopter since you're... Well, if you're visiting, and if you're within the weight limits, yeah. I, don't, I don't want you to get... I think I'm fine. I don't, I don't, I don't want you to blow yourself up to poster size. <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, I, I do, I do t 
take people who I like up and throw them out. I mean, <laughs> no. oh, oh, yeah, you want fear? Here's another fear thing: take the doors off the hel helicopter. Yeah, it's hot out. It's a hot house in there. So what you like to do during summer weather like today, you take the doors off. Now, helicopters are small, they're little small cars, and uh, you think you're going to fall out, especially when you're banking. I love it. It's, no, it's fine. You're not going to fall out unless you jump out, but you're not going to fall out. Well, on that, Stuart, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.